Uh, buenas tardes, and uh, that's about the extent of my Spanish, uh, so I apologize in advance. I'm going to do the rest of this in English, uh, although I must say I've really enjoyed uh, the day uh, practicing my Spanish comprehension, uh, which I have not done in this level of detail since about 10th grade, so uh, that's been really fun. So I'm going to talk, uh, I'm going to talk about the evolution of the venture, the evolution of the firm. Um, it was fitting that Stelio's uh, last slide was a wave, um, and it's clear that there's a giant wave pushing uh, radical change through all parts of society, uh, the economy and society, and I'm going to look under the water a little bit uh, to start to look at the what's underneath and what's the structure uh, and what's the ecosystem that's part of that, because uh, I think that's an important part of figuring out what's next. Uh, I am from a f uh, venture capital firm based in New York City called Union Square Ventures. Um, our office is in New York, but we make investments all over the world, uh, about a, uh, a quarter in uh, Silicon Valley, a quarter in New York, a quarter in the middle of America and Canada, and a quarter in Europe. Um, and we've been doing this for about 10 years, and the we've invested in about 80 companies over the last 10 years uh, across every sector, uh, media, education, health, finance. Uh, but the common theme across all of the companies we work with is that they're platforms. Uh, and they are, that means they're either social networks or marketplaces or developer APIs or sort of other places where people come and we build a structure and, and uh, the companies build a structure and things happen on top. I, and I want to pick up, I'm going to start where the rest of the day has, has sort of left off, which is that we've got this uh, kind of wonderful new structure that's uh, re-architecting so many things in the world, which is the network. Uh, and this is bringing uh, about new connections between, new ways of connecting people in every sector, uh, new ways of communicating, new ways of transacting, new ways of collaborating, uh, changing the nature of the firm, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera and uh, that, so that's happening. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about how that's, you know, it maybe some aspects of that feel like it's a new idea. Uh, but in fact, we're at a pretty mature point uh, in the, the transformation uh, from the industrial economy to the information and the network economy. Um, and uh, there's an economist named Carlotta Perez who has studied uh, radical transformations in technology and their impacts on society over the last several hundred years. And what she found is that whenever a brand new technology sweeps across society, it happens in kind of two phases. An installation phase where sort of the seeds of the technology get planted um, and a lot of weird things happen. And then the deployment phase, which is where the new model, the new thinking sort of permeates through every last corner and every last sector and changes the laws and changes the culture. Um, and let's see where I, okay. And so if you look at the, uh, the age of information, which I think we're in now, you can look at it in roughly a 60 year horizon where 1970 was the, uh, the invention of the semiconductor. And you know, we're sort of, now in the second half uh, of this curve where, where these models are, are, are sweeping across into every sector and are you know, I I permeating existing organizations and institutions and changing laws and all that stuff. Um, and it's interesting to think about the parallels. There we go. Um, so here are the, the other sectors or the other uh, technologies that Perez has studied. So the industrial revolution, the age of steam, uh, steel, electricity, heavy engineering, the age of automobiles and mass production, each of these is about 50 years and follow that same pattern. Um, and it's, so it's just important to think of this not as a thing that sort of just happened or is happening at a fixed moment in time, but it's part of this curve. Uh, and what's interesting about looking at it this way is that you see patterns, uh, and so maybe it can help us look a little bit uh, towards what's coming next. So. If we think about the fact that the information age is sweeping through society over the last uh, 50 years, um, the first thing that it's having an impact on is the old incumbents. So every sector of industry that was developed in the industrial model, you know, healthcare, media, education, finance, uh, those are the folks who are sort of, you know, being disrupted, if you will, by the internet. And we're, you know, that's been happening for a long time now. It's not done, but it's, you know, that's sort of one thing is internet, meets old world. Um, and that's mostly what we talked about earlier today and, and not really what I want to focus on now. What I want to focus on uh, more is this idea that now, now that this technology and this sort of paradigm is more established, there's actually a new set of incumbents who have ridden this wave 
uh, and who are open to being challenged by the next generation of companies and technologies. And so that's Google, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, uh, in Uber, Airbnb, everybody who's built a big network or a big company you know, in the last 15 years uh, on the internet uh, is really the new incumbents and they're the sort of dominant platforms of the information era. And so you know, what is the internet doing to the old economy and now what are we doing about the big players in the new economy? Um, and one way of thinking about it is that this first shift from the industrial economy to the internet economy, economy was about a radical change in communications architecture, right? Things, the, the firm was central, communications happened hierarchically because you really couldn't have them any other way, it just wasn't possible. Uh, and now we have this idea of a network. You know, the firm can look outside of itself to other collaborators. We, we know how to build platforms. Uh, people are connected on their phones wherever they are. So we get this idea of connectivity and communications uh, in every different direction is at the heart of that. That was the first shift. What's interesting is that the, it, I think and we think that the next shift from this sort of uh, version of the internet economy to the next one is really gonna turn on the data architecture. So that's kind of what I mean by the, we're riding this wave of the internet and mobile, uh, and we haven't really paid too much attention to how it was actually constructed underneath, um, but we're starting to. Uh, and, and a lot of that turns on data. So thinking about sort of, you know, uh, building new things and, and transforming organizations, I think it's worth thinking about, you know, who are you, who are you trying to challenge? Um, Challenging the old incumbents or the new incumbents. I'll talk for a second about the old incumbents, the old economy, and then I really want to focus on the new economy. So the firm, uh, you know, the hierarchy, the, the bureaucracy, this is at the heart of what's being, uh, you know, disrupted by the internet. And the way that we think about this transition is this phrase, uh, don't automate, obliterate. So if you can, and I don't mean blow everything up out of the water, I really mean, we really mean workflows and communication. If you think about how something was accomplished in the past through a hierarchical organization and how that same thing could be accomplished uh, now with the network, you're, you're not just sort of making the existing workflows and communication channels more efficient, you're coming up with radically different workflows and communication channels uh, that were never possible before we had computing, before we had mobile, and before we had information everywhere. Um, and as we've talked about all day today, this is about being collaborative and networked. Um, it's about uh, creating structures that go around the outside of our old institutions. Uh, for example, one of our investments is called Figure, Figure One, and it's a photo sharing network for doctors. And we didn't go in and, and sort of, th they don't go in and sell it to hospitals. Instead, doctors just use it, and they share with each other, and they, you know, they comment on, on photos, and they teach each other, and they learn from one another. It's this outside in. And then there's also Inside Out, which is, I think, a lot of the, the, the talk uh, so far here, which is how do you help your, our, our existing organizations like, look outward to the broader you know, ecosystem around them. So where are we in that transition? You know, I think the most mature part is this base layer of uh, information and communication, which is you know, just connectivity and, and devices. But then when you start looking at different industries, obviously media and entertainment uh, is very mature. Transportation uh, you know, is, is getting there, finance, uh, uh, to a degree with, with crowdfunding and, and uh, new kinds of banking, uh, and down the line, and you notice that some of our industries, in my view in particular, health and energy being the biggest ones, have not been transformed to this first version of the networked economy. So there's still a lot of work to do in deploying the web model and sort of challenging the old incumbents. Um, so now let's look at the new incumbents. This is where I think it kind of gets interesting. Um, and uh, there's this idea of platforms, right? Everybody's building platforms. Everything is a platform. Uh, the line from earlier today, I think it was somebody was quoting Robin Chase saying that everything that could become a platform will become a platform. That's happening. Um, and there's the saying, so data is the new oil. Um, I think there's a lot of truth in that. And as we look at the, the new economy and, and sort of thinking strategically at you know, the structures here, the questions really all boil down to not just is there a platform, but what is the nature of that platform? What are the values that are built into that platform? What are the economics that are built into that platform? What are the rules? What's the governance? Um, and this is not, you know, sort of black and white. Uh, there's a lot, lot, a lot of stuff going on in there and a lot of work uh, going on at, at coming up with new ways of building a platform. 
Um, and it's looking at those connections between people and between the platform and its users and you know, thinking, where's the power, where's the control? So I want to talk about a couple of aspects of this um, with a few examples, uh, and there are more, but, but here are a few to start. So power. Power is a big one. If you control the communication channels and you control the data, uh, you're in the driver's seat. Uh, and so where, you know, where does that matter and where do we think about that? Um, one example that I've been spending a lot of time thinking about recently is workers in the on-demand economy. So these are drivers for Uber and Lyft and uh, people doing deliveries and washing and all of these on-demand services that you can uh, purchase with your phone. Uh, so far, workers have had a direct relationship with those platforms and the platforms have amassed a fair bit of power. And it turns out that there's a new generation of companies that are emerging to be a buffer between workers and the work platforms. And all they do is advocate on behalf of the workers. And their goal is to turn sort of an independent person uh, on fighting and sort of striving on their own into you know, a union 2.0 or into an empowered workforce, excuse me. And so you're starting to see as these kind of economies mature, you see where the lines are, you see where the power is, and other services are trying to merge to, to, to sort of strengthen people's hands. Uh, I think that's pretty fascinating. Another one is values and alignment. Uh, there are a lot of values baked into every platform in terms of control, in terms of economics, in terms of the, you know, what you do and what you say and how you act. Um, and there's some innovation happening around that. Uh, a company that we're investors in, Kickstarter, uh, recently reincorporated as what's called a public benefit corporation. <coughs> and this is a company that has in its charter a dual mission, uh, one uh, to its duty to its shareholders, uh, and two, a duty to its uh, social or societal mission, which they've drafted. And if you, if you go to kickstarter.com slash charter, you can read it. And it basically lays out, it's sort of like a, a you know, a mission statement as a binding contract. So they say, we won't do this and we will do this and these are our values and, you know, by the way, later on when we may be a public company and an activist shareholder sues us because we're not pursuing profit aggressively enough, we can point to this and say, actually, we're duty bound to this mission, you know, and that's balancing out some of the, the power in our platform and, and stating our values and our alignments up front. Another big one is privacy. Um, you know, it's interesting, I think, easy to look at all the things that are happening in this industry, in this ecosystem, and think that adding more data and more tracking is the only way to go, and that may or may not be the case. Uh, we're investors in a company called DuckDuckGo, which is a privacy-friendly search engine, so they're taking the opposite of, uh, approach, which is, man, maybe people aren't going to feel so great about their search, uh, search query history being you know, being known and being sold. And maybe there's a new set of values that we can bake into our platform, which says, if you come here and search here, we're not going to share that and we're not going to track you. M you know, maybe people will, will buy into that. Um, well, it turns out they have. Uh, this is a chart of DuckDuckGo's growth over the last five years. Uh, they started with a billboard. As you can see, that really wasn't very uh, effective as a marketing uh, strategy. But then Google made a privacy policy change and you get a little bump. Um, and then there were the Snowden revelations and you get a big bump. Um, and then all of a sudden they're getting integrated into Safari and into Firefox. Um, Apple is another company here who's really be betting their brand on privacy and making that, you know, a uh, part of who they stand for or what they stand for. Uh, another one is transparency. Um, you know, it, this is a really, really tough one. And, and the example uh, that I want to walk through, I think illustrates this pretty well. So. There was an article that went up a week or two ago about someone who, uh, whose father died while staying at an Airbnb uh, rental. And I, uh, just to be, s to be clear, I love Airbnb. I use it all the time. I think it's a fabulous platform, and they work harder than almost anybody on trust and safety to make sure that you know, bad things don't happen. And I think they do a phenomenal job. But there was this one uh, scenario where the, the, the man passed away because he fell uh, on, a, uh, on a, a swing and a tree fell and hit him in the head. And the article and a lot of the feedback about it is very critical of Airbnb for, uh, for not doing a better job of policing for trust and safety. And, and what's interesting about this is you, you wonder, well, what could they or should they have done? And, uh, and it's platforms are in a really interesting position where because on the one hand, they want to create a sense of comfort and safety and security. And that's really their job. That's what Airbnb does. That's what Uber does. On the other hand, they have to be very careful about exposing themselves to too much liability 
Uh, and the more you ensure for trust and safety, the more you're actually taking responsibility for those things. And so, you know, a question is, how could you walk that line? And I, I think one answer that I found interesting was, that, uh, was transparency. So, for instance, imagine that if on every Airbnb listing, you could not only see the reviews about it, but also whether anyone has ever stayed at that place before. And you could make a conscious decision of whether you want to be the first one or not. You know, these questions about sort of how much do we disclose versus how much do we, uh, you know, take it on ourselves to, to make sure everything is okay are, are at the heart of how these platforms manage information and use that information to manage the relationships with, with their communities. Um, okay, so trust. Uh, trust is a really interesting one. It's a broad topic. Uh, we place a lot of faith in all the platforms that we use, for better and for worse. Um, and I think we're starting to see some of the fault lines in that trust, and uh, a lot of really interesting technologies uh, are emerging to try and solve for that. So here's one example. Um <coughs> apparently, in Honduras, uh, they recently replaced the land title system, which was a paper-based title that had been going back for centuries, with a database. Makes sense. You want to have all of those property records in a database, much easier to manage, and so on and so forth. Um, well, it turns out that what happened was um, public officials started end up ending up owning beachfront property um, because the database was not uh, secure. It was compromised. You could not trust the people who were running the database. And as everything moves into a database somewhere, this question of do we trust the people who are running the database will come up again and again and again. And so it turns out the solution that they turned to in Honduras <laughs> Uh, was to use a technology called the blockchain uh, to secure the land title records. Uh, a company, there's a company called Factum uh, that specializes in this. Um, and uh, Simone asked me to spend a few minutes talking about the blockchain because that has come up a few times today. Uh, and I think it's a really interesting part of uh, the, ar the debate around the architecture of platforms and in particular how we ensure for trust in platforms. So a few minutes on the blockchain. So what is the blockchain? Uh, just by show of hands, uh, who here has familiar familiar familiarity with the blockchain generally? Okay, who thinks they could explain the blockchain to a 12-year-old? <laughs> Uh-oh, <laughs> let's hear it. You're on, Javi. Okay. Um, so the blockchain, what is the blockchain? Blockchain, blockchain, blockchain. Blockchain's gonna solve all these answers. Um, so. I will take a crack at describing the blockchain, and then you can pass this on to your 12-year-olds and see if it sticks. So the blockchain is a distributed transaction ledger, okay? And if you think about a ledger, um, it is a definitive record of transactions. The reason you keep two sets of books in a business is that you know if something moves out of one account, it needs to move into another account, and you can't spend it twice. This is the problem the blockchain solves. If W whether it's a transaction of money or a transaction of land, uh, it secures that transaction as a definitive record forever, and it can't be double spent. Um, it's also distributed, meaning it's open source and no one owns it. Uh, there are thousands of computers all over the world running the Bitcoin node software, which produces the blockchain. Um, uh, and uh, no one person can turn the block, can, can mess with those records. Okay, that's very important. And I want to spend a second talking about the relationship between Bitcoin and the blockchain because there's a lot of confusion here and the two terms are get bound up together a lot. And the way I like to describe it is that Bitcoin, the currency, is in some sense an, an app on the blockchain. It's a way of, of transacting uh, financial transactions that then are recorded in this distributed ledger. So that's a, it's a financial, it's a currency app on top of the blockchain. Um, importantly, and this gets to something that Lisa touched on, but only briefly in her talk, Bitcoin is the incentive for maintaining the blockchain. So all of those thousands of computers around the world that are verifying transaction and, and keeping this distributed ledger going, they get paid in Bitcoins. So for every block that you solve, you get 25 Bitcoins. And that's how Bitcoins are created. And so in that way, Bitcoin is, is really more like stock in the blockchain platform. And the early investors, being the early miners, they're called, who dedicated their compute power to build this network, got paid in blockchain. It's just like getting founder stock or early stage stock in a, in a startup that's building a technology platform. So 
so it's this sort of kind of amazing uh, scheme to create this ledger, um, and it's also um, a ledger that we can trust, and it's also a crowdfunding mechanism. Uh, it's a way of building a company and building a technology platform without any outside money, without any stock, without any venture capitalists. Why does that matter? So I mentioned um, the land title problem, and, and so the question is, what other things would you want to secure in the blockchain? So there's financial transactions, money moving quickly, freely, uh, indisputably across the blockchain, land, um, contracts, uh, uh, every transaction on the, on the blockchain can contain a contract that is programmable, which means that, you know, given a set of conditions, you know, I tell you that uh, at five o'clock today, I'm gonna do handstands, or, or better yet, uh, I will uh, turn my computer off at five o'clock, this stupid example. Uh, I could wire that into a smart contract on the blockchain such that once that condition is triggered, it automatically self-executes. So contracts can be built into this and no one can dispute those contracts. Um, silly things like likes or other data that comes off of social networks. Votes, the really big one, a lot of folks working on putting uh, election infrastructure into the blockchain. You know, anything, uh, any, any piece of data really that can be moved through a traditional app can be stored and, and settled and secured on the blockchain. I will give one other way of describing this, which has been helpful for me, which is that the blockchain in some ways is like a public database of timestamps. Um, there was a TV show in the US uh, when I was a kid called Columbo, which is like a detective drama, and this very fuzzy detective, and I, if I remember correctly, he would always walk into the courtroom at the end of the case and pull out a, 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 a postmarked envelope and say, inside this envelope, you'll see that I had you know, the signed contract from this day and the postmark on that envelope proves that this envelope was sealed before that day because you can trust a postmark, okay? Pack it, date, date and time stamped. Really, that's what the blockchain is. Um, it's a way of, of, of packaging data and locking it in time. So if you think about how apps are built and designed right now, architected, you say you've got three apps, Facebook, Twitter, and Uber. Uh, each app has their own software in the green, has their own data, um, and has their own notion of time. You know, I, tr I trust that my receipt from my Uber ride happened when it happened because they say it happened, and th their time server on their, data on, their, you know, on their website, on their web server said so, and I trust them. In a blockchain-enabled world, um, you take these same three apps, a social app, another social app, and a ride-sharing app, and you build them on top of the blockchain, you still have three apps. They each keep some data internally that you trust them to keep, um, but other data can be stored in public uh, and distributed across the blockchain, and that data can be attached to timestamps. So imagine, um, you know, for, I mean, the easiest example is, is Bitcoin, the currency, uh, there's a single database of all the transactions that have ever happened in Bitcoin that everybody who, every app, every bank on top of the, uh, on the Bitcoin network is reading off of that same database. And that's a, a database of transactions and it's also a database of time. And so the, the I think the probably the most profound thing about the blockchain is that we could be moving from a world where we trust every single app to keep their own data and their own time and have monopoly control over that and have all the power that comes from having control over that to a world where apps have some data, but they all are working off a bigger common set of data and a bigger common set of time. And so it won't be possible to build a defensible business that requires having monopoly access over data. This is the big idea. Um, and I think a lot of folks who are working on this see the sort of powerful grip that web companies have over their data uh, and they don't like that, and they're working to build decentralized solutions on the blockchain that shift the power uh, away from the companies and into the commons uh, with data the same way um, that the internet did with communications. So that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Muchas gracias. <laughs>